So hello and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Conservation and Adaptation Resources Toolbox or CART. You may have noticed that we changed our name recently from CCAS to CART. Um, and really as CCAS kind of grew and evolved to support case study development and coordination um, on a broad scale beyond just the Southwest, we decided that it was time to change our name. So we worked with community of practice participants and partners and settled on a um, new name that we hope retains the spirit of natural resource collaboration and conservation while uh, being more easily recognizable on a larger scale. So you'll have to bear with us as we kind of continue to rebrand um, our existing documents and communications, but we're super excited for this change and hopeful that it will really serve as an opportunity to um, increase our visibility and scope and uh, result in some new collaborative partners and projects. So hey everyone, my name is Carly Jewell. I am a conservation biologist with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the at-risk species coordinator for CART. Uh, for anyone unfamiliar, CART is a platform for peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing and the co-production of decision support tools on key management challenges such as introduced aquatic species. Uh, CART supports different communities of practice including the non-native aquatic species community of practice that we launched in May of 2020. If you would like any more information on CART or our communities of practice, um, I will go ahead and drop, a, drop my contact information in the chat as soon as we get started here. Today, we are so excited to host a presentation from Jason Goldberg from the US Fish and Wildlife Service who will talk about using public harvest to control invasive species. Jason is a fish and wildlife biologist with the US Fish and Wildlife Service in Falls Church, Virginia. And as part of science applications, he helps support a variety of activities, including the Fish and Wildlife Service's Climate Change Action Program, Environmental Justice Initiative, Biotechnology, and Data Management. Jason has a joint master's degree in marine science and public policy from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science and College of William and Mary. Thanks for joining us today, Jason. A final reminder, uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please go ahead and enter them in the chat um, and I will relay them to Jason after the presentation. With that, Jason, we are ready for you. Thanks, Carly. And I just want to double check one more time that you see your, your title slide, the card. I headline. sure do. Cool. Yeah, this looks okay. great. It's in presenter mode. You're good to go. Great. Sounds good. Well, I really want to thank everyone for taking the time and good afternoon. <clears throat> so we all know about the problems that invasive species cause. And today I'm here to share the results of research into one of the more unusual and uh, dare we say entertaining solutions. My colleague Amanda DeVleeshauer had a late conflict and is unable to present with me today. But I would like to also acknowledge my other colleagues, Susan Pascoe, Andrew Deans, and Matt Bards, who are also co-authors with Amanda and I on a paper that's currently in review. Um, I also want to note that we are also joined by Dr. Alana Seaman, who uh, actually helped spur us to give some additional thought to this work. So I want to give her a shout out and say thanks for the, her work. Uh, so we believe that encouraging harvest and invasive species can be effective under many circumstances, but it's not as easy as it first appears. And what we'll do is we'll discuss how successful using harvest as a tool depends on an analysis of the species and the area it's invaded and it requires careful monitoring and adaptive management. So we're gonna have a little bit of fun with this today. You all know that the damages in invasives cause at least tens of billions of dollars in environmental and economic damage each year. For example, nutri were introduced into our country and bred for their fur. When the market crashed, again, it was a market that they were comparing to, people released them into wetlands where they thrive and have caused significant damage along the Mid-Atlantic, Louisiana, and Pacific Northwest destroying habitats and water quality benefits that those wetlands provide. Lionfish are eating their way through America's marine biodiversity along their eastern seaboard. Kudzu threatens large areas of the south, a menace threatened to take over at the rate of a foot a day. And sea lamprey threaten the multi-billion dollar fishery in the Great Lakes. So these and other species are significant threats beating down on America's doors and hurting wildlife, recreational opportunities, and agriculture, not to mention the myriad other ecosystem services and values that native species provide us. So from a practical perspective, why not considering harvesting invasives and doing something useful with them? Okay, some of you haven't had lunch. Uh, maybe you might be interested in a little invasive gray squirrel, goat cheese, and hazelnut crostini. Just saying. 
Harvesting offers what appears to be a simple solution to control invasive species populations, but is it really a win-win, and how and when should government get involved? Recently, commercial harvesting and public incentives that encourage consumption have emerged as ways to manage invasives by transforming them into products such as food, both for humans and pets, clothing, and biofuel. nutrient meat has also been popular for their fur and for their meat that's sold as dog treats. Lampreys have been used long time as food for humans. Sea lamprey pie made for the monarchs in England is a tradition that dates back to the Middle Ages. And you can see other examples here. So for example, cane toads have been turned into purses and wallets. I showed you the nutrient furs. Carp, which we'll come back to, were made into hot dogs. I mentioned the kudzu jelly. Kudzu can also be made into herbal supplements, such as what you're seeing here from Amazon. The lionfish, there are cookbooks. Uh, the earrings are uh, something that I found once from a traditional fisher in Mexico, and of course, the lamprey pie. So the question that many people are asking is, if we can drive so many species to extinction by harvesting them, why can't we do the same for invasives? And that's the question that we wanted to explore. When we first started to consider this issue, we realized that we needed to define what an incentive program is and what kind of activities it would encompass. So in a paper that Susan Pascoe and I wrote back in 2014, we focused on programs where incentives, mainly financial, are offered to individuals to locate, remove, and invasive species. So these examples include those such as bounty programs, which are a type of program where a predetermined amount of money is paid to an individual to collect a specified organism, such as Nutrient Louisiana or Rapa Welcome, Virginia. You also have contract operations, where a service provider is hired to harvest the species. You have commercial markets when a perceived market exists for that species and it's then harvested by private entities and offered for sale. And then you have recreational harvest where you're encouraging recreational fishing, hunting, or trapping of invasive species. Lionfish derbies are becoming popular as are programs that encourage hunters and anglers to donate the meat and fish to serve underprivileged families. And these type of programs often involve conducting outreach, modifying seasons, or changing license requirements or bag limits. So certainly harvesting invasive species has potential benefits. It can supplement other control management and containment efforts. It also offers unique and potentially cost-efficient ways to reduce invasive species populations, and it can generate significant public awareness and engagement. Sounds like a silver bullet, right? Ah, not so fast. If only it were that easy. The eminent author and noted invasive species biologist, Mark Twain, that many people you didn't know that, identified some challenges with this option as early as 1907, when he said that the best way to increase wolves in America, rabbits in Australia, and snakes in India is to pay a bounty on their scalps, then every single patriot goes to raising them. While many opportunities exist, there are many aspects that need to be considered prior to developing a harvest program. Some say that harvest should be supported because in situations where the invasion is large or widespread, it may be the only option. However, it implies that harvest has no consequences. Used incorrectly though, encouraging harvest can create what's called a perverse incentive. And a perverse incentive is a public policy term that's used to describe a solution that actually makes the problem worse. If you ever listen to Free Economics Radio, they have a podcast on this whole definition and what a perverse incentive is and what's something called the Cobra effect. Uh, which we'll come back to. So some examples of perverse incentives can include one where people come to rely on the income that bounty programs or commercial markets generate. There may be a pressure to sustain the market or even to spread the invader in order to improve profits. Along these lines, incentives can encourage breeding programs or intentional releases into previously non-invaded habitats. Such actions have been a persistent problem in the angling community where people have illegally stocked favorite game fish into non-native habitats, thus impacting both the native species and threatening restoration efforts. History has also shown that these perverse incentives can occur. I already mentioned the term cobra effect, and that's what probably what Twain was referring to when he likely referred to snakes in India. The term originated in Delhi in the 1900s when the British government offered bounties for cobras. However, it wasn't long before the rather enterprising residents realized it was easier and more cost efficient to breed the snakes rather than to hunt them. When the government ended the bounty program, largely because of this fraud, breeders net the now worthless snakes free, leading to a significant increase in the snake population. In fact, fun trivia, I haven't yet, this has been an interesting research project, haven't found evidence from 
documents showing that there actually was that bounty. But I was in an old photo show a couple of years ago and someone had an old stereo slide, you know, the ones that you look at with a special viewer and you can see it in 3D. And it showed snake charmers. And on the back of it, it was from around this era in early 1900s. And it talked about this same problem. So it became one of my geek out moments when I was out photoshopping. Around that same time, a bounty for rats was also established in Vietnam. And the bounty required presenting the rat tail for payment. It resulted in a collection of tails, but it also left a collection of tailless rats that were alive and free to reproduce, thereby increasing revenue for the bounty participants. So yes, if you're not careful, you could find yourself in even deeper trouble. This issue of perverse incentives isn't unique to this. It's a well-known government problem. So how do you determine in this case whether or not har harvest is appropriate? And what does a critical analysis of the successes and failures really say? Another challenge, you need to have the demand. Since Susan and I developed this slide that I showed you earlier, this was for our 2014 paper, I checked up on these different products and many of these products are no longer available on the market. For example, you can't find the cane toad coin purse anymore. Uh, we'll come back to the carp hot dogs. They're not making the hot dogs anymore, but there are other products. There are lots of medicinal uses, although the one I had found initially isn't still found. Uh, the marsh dog, that company has been sold, so maybe there's hope yet. We'll come back to fashion, can't find the earrings for lionfish, but there are other opportunities. So we're gonna come back to this. I actually wonder whether or not demand was a factor. Curiously, lamprey pie is still around. Uh, I can only assume that lamprey pie was on the menu at the recent coronation of Prince Charles. Uh, when I did a little bit of work to try to track this down, I did find that after all lampreys were sourced from the Great Lakes, for Queen Elizabeth's 50th Jubilee coronation in 20, uh, Jubilee rather, in 2002, because lampreys are almost extinct in England. So to be fair, while a lot of these products are no longer available, new markets are also emerging and new efforts are afoot to encourage the harvest of invasive carp through a rebranding campaign to call them Silverfin or Kopi, as we'll also come back to. And there's a company called Inversa that's been started recently with the goal of sourcing textiles for the fashion industry from invasive species. The Teton Leather Company has lionfish products such as wallets that are retailing for hundreds of dollars. So let's decide, let's say you decide you want to decide whether or not to encourage invasive harvest. What are the factors you need to consider? Well, foremost, Deciding if an incentive program is an appropriate form of invasive species management requires understanding the population dynamics of the targeted species. Invasive species exhibit distinct life history traits that aid their ability to thrive in new habitats. Consequently, the principles applied to managing game or endangered species may not be directly applicable to managing an invasive. And lower to, in order to lower a population size, the mortality has to, increase, has to exceed the birth rate. Simple math. In order to calculate that number, though, you have to have an understanding of what the reproductive and survival rates are. Second, targeting populations may lead to biological overcompensation. As a population declines, additional resources become available, thus making survival easier for those individuals that remain, promoting an increased breeding and survival. Uh, one paper found that invasive species with limited connectivity, highly fecund adults, and strong adult control of juvenile abundance have the potential for overcompensation and may not be successful candidates for eradication programs. Even if eradication is achieved on a local scale, reinvasion is still possible. That's the primary reason why species may be more successfully eradicated from islands, yet similar efforts on the mainland can fail. Prevention, monitoring, and rapid response programs will still be necessary. As previously mentioned, harvesting may require high removal rates. Let's take a look at two case studies here. In the case of lionfish, models have predicted that reducing lionfish populations are going to require annual removal rates of between 15 and 65 percent. This may be a high number, but one derby, one day derby events have caught as many as 1,400 lionfish, reducing local populations by 60 percent. Thus, such events may be a viable option to protect ecologically important areas. This study also shows that eradication isn't always necessary to achieve positive benefits. Let's compare this to garlic mustard, plant species. So removal rates for garlic mustard are also high. Research has shown that control efforts may only be successful if 85% of the adults or 95% of the rosettes are removed. Again, huge number. Plants may be more challenging. Plant harvest typically doesn't remove the entire organism. If you're leaving behind seeds or reproductive parts, you can trigger a new population. 
So another issue to consider is the size of the infestation. Uh, Britain implemented an eradication campaign in 1981 that employed 24 trappers for nutrient. Less than 10 years later, the trapping campaign was declared a success and terminated. Replication of the British program in the US is unlikely as the population is much larger and widespread. Populations in Louisiana alone are 10 times the previous infested area in Great Britain. More successful area efforts, however, have been achieved in the Delmarva, Delmarva Peninsula along the eastern seaboard of the US, though some concerns remain that Nutria could return. Although local success is possible, complete eradication in the US may not be a viable option simply because of the greater financial and staff resources that would be required to achieve results. So cash per unit effort can also be a real problem. Quick test for you. This picture from the National Park Service has a nine foot orange python in it. Can you find it? Okay, well, part of you, you can, can, uh, Jason, I can see it. Can everybody see it? I figured Kristen would. Does anyone else from Florida, you might have some experience spotting these things. So it is partly a trick question. It's not orange, but it is very cryptic and it is nine feet long. You know, that's the point. Not only does a species that's cryptic make it more difficult to locate or capture, it also makes it difficult to estimate the population size. South Florida Water Management District has estimated that between 5,000 and 180,000 Burmese pythons are living in South Florida. It's a huge range and they are really hard to find. You can be a foot, two feet away from these snakes and not see them. And I've gone looking and I can vouch for that even with my limited research skills. Uh, without accurate information, it is impossible to monitor and evaluate the success of control programs. As I mentioned in the, one of the previous slides, to encourage some kinds of harvest, the organism needs to be found relatively easily. People want to find an organism when they hunt. They don't want to spend hours looking for it. So if it's cryptic, located in an isolated area, or it's difficult to access, certain options will become more likely or incentives offered for harvest will have to be greater. Further, in the case of harvest programs, it's been argued that removing the first 99% of a target population can cost less than getting that last 1%. This is because more time and resources are needed to locate and remove individuals as population numbers decline. When this occurs, incentive programs may begin to lose their effectiveness as the financial benefit becomes an insufficient motivator for the greater effort needed to capture the remaining individuals. We must also consider the tyranny of small numbers. Invasive species populations can recover quickly even when only a few members of that population remain. So for this reason, if what you're considering is eradication, eradication can be a high risk undertaking. Control efforts require careful consideration and should only be undertaken if there's strong commitment and ability to remove nearly every individual. Natural resource managers should be prepared to increase time and resources at the final stages of the program when density and species impacts are extremely low. So next, here are the recommendations from all of this. And I'll be presenting these slides as we go through to make it hopefully a little bit easier to follow. You wanna understand the population dynamics. Try to anticipate the program's impact on the target population and determine the number of individuals that have to be removed for the program to be effective. Prevent reintroduction. Control won't be successful if, image, if individuals can move back in or release back into the management area. Let's take a look at some ecological considerations. Biological invasion often results in the loss of biodiversity as well as an alteration of ecosystem processes. Complexities that mean restoring naked native ecosystems is not as simple as removing the invader. Unexpected consequences of removal can include several things. First, some invaders may render the habitat unsuitable by native species. For example, some can change the hydrology, nutrient content, or even salinity of an area. An invasive species can act as a new predator or a new food source, thereby removing the species can throw off trophic relationships, further impacting native species. Also, removal can result in ecological release of a second more problematic invasive. For example, removing feral pigs and sheep in Hawaii has resulted in increased cover of flammable invasive grasses. So getting rid of one, you're simply adding in another one back into the mix. Invasive species may have a positive association with native species. Even though their greater harm is still out there, they still can provide a localized benefit. 
Salt cedar removal has been repeatedly delayed in the western U.S. because it provides significant nesting habitat for the endangered willow flycatcher or bird. So given these complex interactions among species and their environment, it's difficult to predict the outcome of the removal of the invasive. This justifies careful evaluation of the functional roles and trophic interactions between the invasive and native species prior to initiating any program that encourages harvesting. Now, yes, it's going to apply to any kind of control you're going to apply. It's not just harvesting. But if you're looking at harvest, again, this is one of the things that you have to keep in mind. So let's take another look at two case studies. In the case of lionfish, I've already talked a little bit about this. Models have been used to calculate the number of fish that have to be removed to reduce impacts from predation and competition allowing for native fish recovery. Field trials then show that once this number was obtained, native prey fish increased by 50 to 70%. This study showed that eradication isn't always necessary to achieve positive benefits. In New Zealand, harvest efforts proved to be successful at reducing deer populations. However, the benefit of this reduction has been minimal. When present, the deer removed most of the edible plants within their browsing range. This altered litter quality and soil properties that have hindered recovery of native ecosystems. So this study highlights the point that just removing an invasive isn't just enough to restore the native ecosystem. You've got to be looking at other factors as well. Recommendations that come out of this, looking at ecological outcomes, given the complex interactions among species and their environment, it's difficult to predict the outcome of the removal of invasives. And this requires careful evaluation of species interactions and the effect of removing an invasive species program prior to starting it. Restoring native ecosystems, Restore restoration of native species and habitats are important to addressing impacts to the environment and to the economy. So I, I did see the question before about whether or not invasives are vectors for communicable diseases. This slide is for you. Invasive programs often involve members of the general public who may be untrained in the proper methods of capturing and handling the target species. There are obvious risks from larger aggressive animals. I would prefer not to meet a python without some training out in the wild. Uh, again, I've actually been searching for these animals in the Everglades, and I can absolutely attest that the conditions are inhospitable and downright dangerous, frankly. Lionfish can carry a risk of envenomation from spines if you're not catching it safely, and they can have a possible risk of ciguatera poisoning. Mitten crabs from the River Thames were tested for parasites and toxins prior to harvest, and in this case, the testing found that the crabs were fit for human consumption. And I've already noticed it, noted the challenges with deer, so in that case, commercial harvesting of wild red deer for venison in New Zealand was halted after a few harvesters took animals from areas where pesticides had been used to control possums. So testing failed to find pesticide residue and exploitation was resumed once we had stricter reg regulation. So yes, so uh, Liam, looking at your question here, that's absolutely what you need to do. You need to make sure that you've got training, that you're doing the work to understand the target species, what are those risks and can it transmit diseases or other cause other problems? Uh, and we can talk about this more too at the end if you have additional questions about it. So recommendations from this. Before managers encourage harvest, you should ensure that the target species does not pose a risk to human health through handling or use for its intended purpose and ensure that people are properly trained in species capture. Uh, another quick example actually is that with lionfish, there's a video and I wish I had a copy of it that was done for TV news station. It was very much a feel good piece about how we're helping the environment by catching lionfish. The person that they were interviewing was a spearfisher person. And I saw this person spear lionfish. The spear went right through the fish and hit the reef, thus causing damage to the coral. Again, without that right training, you're removing the lionfish, but you're also doing long-term damage to the coral in the process. Yet a lot of people on the reef who don't have the training, you're gonna end up doing more harm than good to your local ecosystems. So legal issues are important. If invasives are found on private land, private property rights needs to be respected. Legislation may help encourage or allow access to encourage to allow access to all lands to ensure that invasive individuals and a population have been removed. For example, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resource Regulations allow inspectors to enter private lands with a warrant if needed to ensure that prohibited species are not present. In addition, state and federal laws may restrict the movement of species, which can impact the marketability of some species if the preferred commercial product is live and laws forbid the interstate movement of living specimens. As was noted earlier, harvest can create a source of income that does little to, to encourage the long-term control or permanent reduction of the target species. 
This can encourage breeding programs or intentional release of species back into the control area or into previously non-invaded areas. So-called buck-up biologists or midnight managers who legally stock preferred fishing species present a significant threat to fisheries management in the United States. Add a commercial incentive and the risk can be even higher. Fraud can also occur. It may actually be easier to import organisms or breed them on private property rather than capture them from the wild. And again, I've already highlighted some examples there. We've already discussed ecological concerns with pop, small populations of invasives rebounding. From a socioeconomic perspective, people may lose interest as cash per unit effort decreases. Adaptive un, uh, management will be needed to change strategies, either by offering higher premiums as numbers decline or by changing to other control options. Even at a high cash per unit effort, incentives may be needed to encourage the capture of high enough numbers of the population to make a dent. So for example, some plants require very, very high removal rates annually to make a difference. Enforcement and monitoring can make and help address these issues. So monitor for unintended consequences, employ adaptive management again as needed, and determine the appropriate points for inter government intervention. When do you want to switch what, you're, what strategy you're applying and how do you do so? We're now seeing a, a tremendous demand for native carp. It's a species that federal and state governments have already spent billions of dollars working to control. They're the subject of intense study and numerous efforts are underway to harvest them. There is a strong demand for this fish in Asia. Government agencies have considered harvest as one control option. Overfishing is being used to try to provide some level of control while research efforts continue on other population control and eradication efforts. In the meantime, a number of private enterprises have emerged seeking to exploit carp. Humanitarian efforts have also been studied with the idea that maybe the carp can be canned and fed to hungry people, both here in the US and abroad. Research is shedding light on the benefit and issues surrounding carp harvest. For example, larger size classes are more desirable by fishing communities, but if the younger and smaller fish are not taken, harvest will likely be ineffective as a control tool. Therefore, incentives are needed to encourage commercial fishers to take these fish. Incentives may also be needed to encourage fishers to take even larger numbers of carp because collapsing populations in some areas may require exploitation rates of 70% or more of the population. There are also important socioeconomic questions that need to be answered. Both NOAA and the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and I've been on the receiving end of those calls, have received questions from private individuals seeking funds to start commercial ventures aimed at eradicating carp. So what's the government responsibility here? What if a bank won't loan a company money because their business model says that they want to work themselves out of business. And I've actually heard this happen. Likewise, what happens if companies invest money and resources into harvest, and then scientists find a more effective way of controlling the species? What's our responsibility to them? Government regulation is also uh, important. So non-native carp are listed as injurious by the US Fish and Wildlife Service, which prohibits their movement. Yet initially the market for carp was perceived to be live, which presented potential problems on the other hand, Florida managers have set regulations essentially declaring an unlimited open season on lionfish. So new research and time will tell how successful harvest efforts can be. As I mentioned before, eradication is not always necessarily the optimal choice. In some cases, you may want to aim for a level of control that keeps the level of damage done by the invasive species to some acceptable level, looking at a benefit-cost analysis. Sea lamprey and northern pikewin, north pikewin, offer contracting, uh, con oh, sorry, offer contrasting examples of management. Lamprey in the Great Lakes are controlled by lamprecides and sterilization of males, while pike minnow are, are controlled through a prize offered to anglers. Both have been effective at achieving their goals. Even with the, such different methods, there are some commonalities. Management objectives are defined for each species. As dedicated funding for invasive species management is limited, Research managers should conduct a basic analysis to identify the most effective solution needed to achieve desired goals. In the case of sea lamprey and pike minnow, eradication is not a practical option, but minimizing population size is achievable. Each effort requires dedicated and sustained funding. In this case, both species cannot be eradicated, but harvest is being applied and not the other. Both require long-term funding to achieve their goals. You want to identify possible adaptation management strategies that are needed. In the case of the pike minnow program, managers did evaluate other control options and they determined that the price system really is the most cost-effective control mechanism for what they use. Likewise, 
sea lamprey control efforts appears to be in a steady state needed to achieve population goals, but there is always new research ongoing into new ways to combat the threat that they pose. Incorporating adaptive management where necessary. Monitoring is essential to determine the effectiveness of the program and ensuring goals are met. In these two examples, management goals continue to be met with current methods, and they have active monitoring programs to verify that. So while both lamprey and sea lamp, uh, both lamprey and pike minnow are recognized as harmful, in some cases, the benefit of harvest may outweigh the harm of the species. It's a simple benefit cost analysis. At that point, the species may no longer be considered invasive, but rather becomes a beneficial non-native, even acknowledging that it is still causing some harm. If that's the case, management may need to shift to sustainable development strategies for harvest. Such strategies have been employed before to manage Australian Asasia species in South Africa, which are important to the plantain forestry industry, but also have significant impacts on the ecosystem. So define the management objectives, understand your costs, incorporate adaptive management, and determine appropriate points for government intervention. Outreach, also vitally important. Events such as the Python Challenge in Florida are not gonna reduce the number of these invasive species, but they do raise awareness about the nature of the threat and invasives in general. The Python Challenge has generally been recognized as being successful in raising awareness and wasn't intended as a control mechanism. For example, in 2021, around 600 participants only captured 223 snakes from a population, again, estimated to be in the tens of thousands not a very high catch per unit effort. And again, going through the Everglades in the middle of summer when it's hot, it's muggy, it's buggy, not always a lot of fun. Uh, so you're not going to eradicate or control the population. However, the event is popular and it garners national news coverage. So organizers recognize that they need to emphasize that not catching snakes is still a successful outcome. Management goals need to be communicated to the public. On the other hand, community members and animal rights groups may not favor incentives for ethical or cultural reasons. Several years ago, contract trapping of invasive rhesus monkeys in Florida's Silver River State Park had to be halted after objections from animal rights groups that many of the captured monkeys were being sold to research facilities. In Maryland and Virginia, they've held Potomac snakehead tournaments for several years, but it's unclear whether it raised positive awareness or is simply encouraging more fishing more sport fishing demand for snakehead in the Chesapeake Bay and Blackwater River. Uh, the Maryland Department of Natural Resources announced a tagging program last year with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, where both agencies are playing, placing yellow or blue tags on up to 500 northern snakeheads. Each tagged northern snakehead caught and harvested from now through 2024 could be rewarded with a gift card of $10 or $200, depending on the tag. So in some ways, it's similar to the pike minnow program that I mentioned before. Strong public outreach will ensure that the public understands and accepts the need for control. You might also start thinking outside the box. So back in the work that Susan Pascoe and I published in 2014, we were aware of the restaurateur community, but we didn't really pursue significant outreach with them. However, chefs are catching on to the idea of invasives for sustainability and could be excellent partners. Uh, Dr. Seaman, who's here on the call today, uh, has recently published a paper actually making this very point, which I thought was great. So it might be beneficial to partner with nutritionists and others to better understand and promote where appropriate the health benefits of eating invasives. Chef Parola, for example, has been a leader behind the effort to rebrand non-native carp to silverfin, but he emphasizes reducing populations to sustainable levels, not eradication. A more recent campaign has branded non-native carp as Kopi, and on the first day of launch, 21 chefs and re retailers committed to putting Kopi on their menus. So maybe we'll see those carp hot dogs again soon. Uh, and the distributors are making Kopi products available. In Connecticut, Chef Bon Lai for a number of years designed a full invasive sushi menu that included treats such as cannibal jellyfish. So if both government and industry agree to the same goals, outreach to these partnerships really can generate more ge awareness and be beneficial. It's just making sure that people when they understand what's on the menu, understand why it is we're trying to get rid of this thing. Working with social scientists can also help you understand public perceptions in a given region and for a target species, which can help you design effective strategies to meet your goals. So you wanna communicate the impacts of the invasive species in order to encourage active participation and help the public understand the need for long-term eradication and control. 
You can also, through this kind of outreach, generate financial support for the effort from decision makers. You can help build ethical support from a community that may not favor the killing of large numbers of animals for moral, emotional, or cultural reasons. And as I noted earlier, outreach can also help ensure that the public is trained properly to capture the target species without harming themselves or the environment. So simply put, incorporate outreach programs. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground here, and I know I've thrown out a lot of examples. Here are the key points from all of this. Successful application of harvest incentives is species and region dependent. Good planning, good planning and monitoring are as essential for any other option. Incorporate adaptive management. Harvest will not work on its own. And it might be cost effective, but it is not free. I sincerely want to thank Hart for giving us the opportunity to come out to talk today. We encourage you to explore Harvest. Just be sure to employ the other tools in your arsenal. And we look forward to hearing from you as this work moves forward. If you have any questions, please let us know. I also want to acknowledge a number of different folks. I've already mentioned Dr. Seaman and the work that she's been publishing on the restaurateur community. I'd like to acknowledge the work of the Mississippi River Basin Panel on Aquatic Nuisance Species, who also developed draft recommendations in 2007 for conducting infective harvest, uh, and they've recently updated that in 2016. I want to thank the Invasive Species Council's Invasive Species Advisory Committee for its work on a related white paper and the leadership of the National Invasive Species Council. And I put up on the screen here, and I can put these into the, uh, the chat, uh, a couple of the papers. So there's one that Amanda, I have, along with uh, Andrew Danes and Matt Barnes um, and Susan Pasco have currently in press right now, that's following up actually on the paper by Dr. Seaman. And then I've also, if you're looking for a lot of great examples of how harvest has been applied, there's a great reference in the work that Matt, Andy, and others have done as a book chapter, uh, and we can provide that as well. So with that, really again, want to thank, oh, and I also sincerely want to thank, you know, this work was built as a review, building on a lot of scientific research from the invasive community. So we really appreciate that firsthand work that was taking place in the lab and on the ground to develop these ideas, understand what harvest is, want to thank the people who actually were creative enough to thinking about how do you create you know, a new drink made out of crab shells, that kind of thing. You know, without that creative and ingenuity and the researchers behind all of this, we wouldn't be here talking about our recommendations today. So a big, big thank you to everyone who's involved with all that. And with that, looking forward to your questions, comments, and recipes. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jason. That was fantastic. I feel like my mind is spinning in a bunch of different directions um, and seeing some appreciation in the Zoom room. I want to open it up. I um, jotted down some questions, but would love to prioritize the questions of the folks in the room. So please feel free to either drop a question in the chat or go ahead and just um, either raise your hand or unmute yourself and, and come on and share your question. Um, we have some time here, so I'd love to see some conversation. Um, and maybe I will kick it off with the first question while folks are thinking about theirs, um, which Jason was a question. Um, I was curious if there's like a database that exists that compiles mm -hmm. examples of public harvest programs that managers might be able to reference to see like how others are rolling out programs for different species, what those costs were, some of those like management considerations. Do you know if that exists? So I don't know if there's a database. And in fact, I'll ask if Matt and Andy are both here, my co-authors on this new work, they're welcome to speak up. They published in their paper several references that people could use. There's another one I'm going to put in the chat here. I did look today to see if it was updated. A fellow by the name of Joe Roman had a very active website. And I know Matt and Andy had one as well, um, eattheinvaders.org. And that lists a lot of really good case studies. It doesn't look like he's updated it in the last year or so, but he still has a number of different examples from uh, land and sea and fresh and everything in between. Oh, this is great. Thank you. Any questions from the group? Does anyone want to? Oh yeah, Kristen does here in the chat. Um, oh. Have I? Oh, 
sorry, have I looked at all the iguana meat challenges? This was a common theme when you worked for Fish and Wildlife Commission. Many are harvested for other products. I was not even aware. Matt or Andy, do you? So I can probably explain a little bit. So we would get um, approached by folks who are trying to create a market for iguana meat in Florida, but it's not as easy as you would think. Um, and that was one of the issues. I mean, South Florida is covered in iguanas. It really is. Um, and one of the challenges creating a market for something that's considered like bush meat. Um, so that was an, an issue with trying to figure out because the fish and wildlife agencies aren't equipped to do that. It's usually another agency in the state or the FDA that's involved in something like that. So that's another challenge for even trying to create a food market um, for species. Fish are easier, but uh, something like an iguana was a challenge. And then other issues of you know the food safety issue, like right. mercury in pythons is ridiculously high. I've never touched a python despite having many people offer me cookies made from python eggs. Seriously, um, but for those of you working on food issues, that's actually a challenge in Florida for some of these um, large bodied lizards. You know, iguanas, because they're herbivores, are probably a little bit safer to eat, but anything at the top of the food chain, like a python or even now monitors, um, be more likely to bioaccumulate a lot of heavy metal. Yeah, Kristen, that gets to a question I had, which was thinking about more on like, barriers that exist to utilizing invasive animals or plants um, and getting them sourced into restaurants or community food networks? Like, are there different regulations associated with that that folks should look into and just general barriers that exist there? So you have to take a look at the individual state and the market that you're looking at. You know, for example, it can be with recreational harvest. It can be hard to get, say, feral pigs or feral hogs or, or deer into the grocery store because there are FDA regulations that may apply. Uh, I already mentioned the injurious wildlife regulations, that's Kristen's shop, you know, and some of the issues that that poses. And if a state prohibits the movement of a species outside of the state, that's gonna be a whole separate thing. Uh, you also need to create limits or open up the limits. In Florida, it's open season on lionfish, but you had to still go through the process to create that market, or at least not create the market, but to, just to create the incentives to allow the market to take hold. And even still with that, Jason, with lionfish, um, the commercial use licenses, people still were seen as a barrier. So they cost mm -hmm. $50 for you to be able to have like a commercial license mm -hmm. to remove lionfish. And that was still an issue for those people, even though it was $50. Um, really? Because I've seen Whole Foods selling it for like nine or ten dollars a fillet. So you figure one good day's fishing, you're covered. But I, you'd think so. But yeah, I mean, it's any kind of a still barrier. any kind of a barrier. People, yeah. we had a whole list of these different kinds of barriers working on the lionfish control plan for the state of Florida. Interesting. Really interesting. Thanks for sharing, Kristen. Um. Matt Barnes did did riff on the iguana conversation. It does sound like there is desire from some folks to eat iguanas. Um, another one of those that apparently tastes like chicken. So someone will need to have to. I've eaten iguana. I don't think it tastes like chicken. <laughs> oh, you heard it here first. <laughs> I prefer my lionfish. Thank you. I think, say, this is this is Andy Dynas, and I think one of the important parts about whether it tastes like chicken or what tastes good is throwing it over to collaborators who are chefs, right? I could make your $99 Wagyu steak taste not awesome if I had a bad day in the kitchen, right? And so good chefs can do the reverse. Um, so that's, that's one good reason to be partnering with uh, people another way around. We even saw, I have a, I, I didn't have a picture of it. Maybe I should. I found a high a middle school student who was, who had latched onto this as a project for their writing class and actually produced a little cookbook of recipes for invasives in their, their region. I think it was the Pacific Northwest. So yeah, people can be pretty creative. That's, 
Yeah, that's great. Hey, Andrew, I, I guess I have a follow up question for you. Um, in general, being like, do, do you prepare invasive animals or plant material? I, I mean, I, I have in the past, I'll turn on my camera. Um, we've done this in the past. I mean, Matt and I, years ago, when we first got into this game, we started out with a blog, there's a baseboard.org. And yeah, we, we would go out and we would collect and, and prepare uh, invasive species. Um, time, time has moved on from our, our ability to do that on a regular basis. Um, yeah, so it's still up. You can go check it out. It, it can be another resource for what's available. And I think what's up there is the lowest hanging fruit of what you can probably spend your time to go collect. Um, but yeah, th there's a lot of species and, it, and it's not just easy, or it's, it's not always easy. Um, I mean, you got to know where to look. And if, if you decide to go collect, um, I can't even think of a good example right now. If you want to try rusty crayfish or something, I don't know. Uh, you got to know what lake to go look at, right? And you got to know how to set the traps and, and how to pull them. You got to have the time to do it. And if you don't know where to look, um, it's a challenge. But yeah, invasivore.org, yeah, eat the invaders, I think is that.com. But some of those are, are pretty low length, low hanging fruit. Blackberries are easy in the Northwest. I think. Yeah, that's what I was wondering if you um, had any, this is perfect, this is exactly what I was looking for, like if you had any recommendations or um, recipes or anything like that. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Sorry to put you on the spot there. Thanks for jumping on. There's a lot it's of a, them out there. I'm sorry, go ahead, Andy. No, I, that's what I was going to say. It's it's a lot of, there are a lot of them out there. Um, the easiest thing for us is, you know, we, we knew invasive species, so when we spotted them, I go, we can write about that. So we just pick it up as we go. Um, so coming at it from the other way around. And you know, the other thing too is I think with the chef community, they can also help make the icky seem a little more palatable. One of the issues that I remember coming across with Nutria was that people were hesitant to eat them because they're rodents. I'd still be game if I could ever find one. Um, it's just yeah, very hard to find the meat for sale. So there, and I, I will say. Human humans eating food is the most notable um, and and shiny aspect of eating invasive species or harvesting invasive species. Um, there's whole other industries that are reliant on protein sources that uh, feed things that aren't necessarily as picky as humans. Um, I can imagine pet food as one. There's that large dog, at, um, which may be coming back to life. I'm not sure. I was a swamp dog. Either way, swamp dog. Yeah, they were uh, bought out by someone recently. I think. Yeah, so so that's an example. But uh, lots of industries, pet food, um, aquaculture, various uh, you know chickens, uh, pigs. All these things demand protein sources. Yeah, that's a great point. I hadn't really thought that much about that. Anything else from the group while we have this wonderful wealth and collection of knowledge? I was actually going to jump in here a little bit. I'm Awana Seaman. Uh, thanks for inviting me to this, actually. And this is really interesting because I've kind of been stumped on things on where to go next. So this has kind of helped getting my brain started. But I, I keep wrestling with this idea of how to kind of tackle the silos. You know, and you talk a lot about the different kind of incentivizations you could do. And I think somebody touched on this, this kind of need for collaboration. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts on how to incentivize collaboration rather than incentivize, say, hikers that are already in an area and get them to collect something they happen upon versus chefs in a restaurant industry. Like it seems like some sort of that collaboration needs to happen to get that. And you, you touched on it, that education to the right people in in addition to the motivation, but I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that about how to incentivize that kind of collaborative approach. Wow, that's a great one. Um, so I think there it strikes at the outreach question, right? As well as the policy side. So you know, I'm not gonna put her on the spot, but I don't know if Kristen is, is from Florida. I don't know, Kristen, did you ever work on 
the lionfish derbies or anything like that and the python challenge because that's one of those examples that brings all these different partners together there's in fact there's a lionfish derby that you sent me coming up in destin florida coming up soon i think it's going to be like this two-day festival yeah there's a festival that goes on um, at the beginning of the lionfish challenge which lasts all summer in the state of florida with multiple prizes and stuff so i was involved in the origination of that program that's been going on for a few years now um, and up to this year, involved in running the Python challenges every year, along with dealing with um, every interesting question that comes in from members of the public about how to harvest um, some of these different species. And I think a lot of it comes down to wanton waste, right? People want to feel like what they're removing from the wild has some other utility, that it's just not getting thrown away. Um, so there's a social aspect of that. And and actually, there's another one here I'm going to put in a, as a link. If you want a really good case study, it's the Kopi with, with that's how they're rebranding the car. Because right. there you're seeing all these different partners coming together. And this is not something that came together overnight. There were efforts to try to rebrand carp as, as Silverfin for a number of years. I mentioned, I showed you the picture I had of the hot dogs. So it really was the, it was controversial, I think, with, the, with some of the surrounding states. Not every state agreed that they wanted to do the harvest initially because the states that didn't have a lot of carp were afraid people would try to bring it in and drop it in their waters. Whereas the states that had the carp were, oh, and oh my gosh, we got to get rid of these things. So it really took that consensus building. And uh, I'm, I'm happy uh, to put you in touch with some of those folks, Kevin Irons and others who really did the legwork on the ground uh, at the state level to find you know, who are the right people that need to be at the table, no pun intended. And it was a matter of bringing together government officials, the commercial fishing fleets, uh, you know, other outreach groups. Um, it sounds like looking at their work, they have an entire marketing campaign that they've had to develop. Um, I think that one has potential to really stand as a, a real model, but the, the results are, in, they're not all in yet on how successful a campaign is it going to be come back in a couple of years, but they have looked at it as one option. I know another one I'm thinking about, there have been efforts that government has organized to look at blue catfish here in Chesapeake Bay uh, and to try to harvest those. Uh, again, it's end of the day, I think it really is a matter of one person saying that they recognize that this is a problem and taking the initiative to reach out and bring all these different communities together just as in the same vein when you know when Susan and Matt and Andy and I and Amanda found your paper um, and realized we had not thought much about how to reach out to the culinary community. Um, someone interested in managing a specific species needs to be doing that uh, and getting the scientists at the table, breaking down those doors. Maybe not the best answer to your question, but maybe because I think it's a matter of getting people who have different expertise on all these different issues at the table so that you can say, well, what's a problem impacting you? Why can't the chef bring in this plant into their restaurant? Well, if it's a government problem, do you have someone from the state who can say, well, hey, I know how to break this door down? Or do you have someone from the federal government that says, well, I know how to change this regulation? Um, you know, and getting that team together at a target by target level. You're giving me long-term job security potential here, which I appreciate. Yeah, and I think you touch on some good stuff there. And we've we tried a little bit of that with reaching out to chefs and stuff like that. And that's obviously an entirely different breed of um, individuals and just outlook on things than you know working with wildlife scientists and stuff like that. I'm curious about that lionfish festival you mentioned. Did you guys host any chefs or like food demonstrations or anything like that, or was it kind of strictly focused on um, get the animal? Let's celebrate that. So there's a long history of these lionfish festivals from like the last five or six years, and every year they have lionfish. Um, chefs that are involved in a handful of local restaurants are really engaged. Um, Florida has been very fortunate that they have a lot of very active um, seafood industry people that are engaged with this issue. Um, so it's it's been great. Even with the Python Challenge events, those first two that we held, we had chefs there too. 
um, serving up lionfish at those, like all kinds of invasive species. I was talking about iguanas. One of the, the state chef, the guy that is actually our state chef, came down and was putting together iguana tacos with mango salsa and came up with like all kinds of menus and everything. So I think there's a really great opportunity to, to deal with that. For some of the other invasive species issues, leather should be an issue, um, but it's hard to get into that fashion industry, although there's a lot of people that are trying to do that right now with python skins and the state works really hard to engage with the people who are collecting those animals to provide those skins for industry. Again, back to that not wanting to have product potential products go to waste. I don't recommend the python soap though. So I'm going to put a link in the chat here too. And I'm going to put a caveat. I'm not endorsing anyone. I'm just providing references here for some of the companies that we've noted. So I put in one for Choose Kobe. Um, I've put in one. And again, I would note there that the Fish and Wildlife Service has participated in looking at harvest as a model with the states. Uh, I put in the link for the Lionfish Festival. And then regarding the, the leather industry, the one that I've heard about more recently is Inversa. And it's a fascinating website to go shop around and see the different companies that they're working with and how they're trying to develop this. And if anybody watches any of those History Channel shows with um, some of those Python hunters, one of the guys actually has his own leather company that he sells tons of Python leather, way more than Inversa. Uh, there's a handful okay. of them that are doing them. Um, yeah, he's an interesting character. I love the conversation that this has heard. Um, there was one more question I want to get us to from Bethany, which was um, related to specifically Nutria. And so if anyone in the room um, has experience with this, would love their, their feedback or thoughts on it. But the question was, um, have there been any negative, have there been many negative or unintended consequences to Nutria harvest programs or have they been successful? So it's a matter of how they've been structured. In the Delmarva Peninsula, they did not encourage recreational harvest. They sent out trappers. Uh, and that was an intentional choice because they wanted to get every single last nutria. And again, that catch per unit effort, not happening. In England, more successful. Uh, again, limited area, smaller population size. There, last I saw, the results were successful. In Louisiana, they're offering, or they were offering $5 per tail. Uh, I think there, I, I don't know, I haven't seen all the monitoring studies. I don't think it's made the problem worse. I just don't know how much better it's been though. But that's an interesting question. I don't know if someone else on the line would have better information about Nutria. I'll, I'll unmute for a second just to thank you for addressing that. Yeah, we... Um... So I'm over in Arizona, but I'm in region two. And uh, I know we got some funding to start a Texas strike team, Texas Gulf Coast strike team. And one of the species that um, they were explicitly told to address was nutria. And so we've kind of regionally been like, oh, you know, it was the New Mexico guy and me. And we were like, I don't know anything about nutria. So um, yeah, we're just learning, learning a bit right now. And I was just curious if there are any insights. It's, just, it's basically everything that I talked about with this talk. Yeah. Look at how big the population size is. How hard is it to catch them? What are you going to do when the population size drops? And how do you make sure you're getting every last one, especially with Nutria, which really can come back quick? Right. Yeah, I, I don't even know some of those basic answers. And I don't know if anybody does. Um, yeah. I'm sure we'll be learning a lot in the near future. But uh, I get the feeling that our goal wouldn't be eradication and that it would just be a matter of suppressing the population and yeah, I was just wondering if there were any of those indirect consequences that you mentioned in some of these other places where that was, where they had comparable goals and, but yeah. I don't know if a tailless nutria can survive. I'm guessing not. I'm sorry, what was that? I don't know if a tailless nutria oh. can survive, <laughs> which is again, what Louisiana had done was again, harvesting the tail, um, but <laughs> Again, I, I do know that in Britain, and if you look at our paper, we've got the citations and there are follow up with me later on. I'm happy to send them. Okay. It's just that right now they haven't, aside from the Louisiana market, they haven't done a huge effort to try to use harvest in that way. It's more of the UK case that we're more familiar with. Okay, great. Thank you so much. 
Fantastic. Well, I'm noting we are at the top of the hour here. So I will go ahead um, and do a, just a really brief wrap up here. Um, just thanking everyone for taking the time to join us today. Um, this webinar again was recorded and will be made available on the CART YouTube channel um, where you can find all our previous webinars. Um, you can also check out our case study dashboard and I'm dropping, I just dropped those links in the chat. Um, we have 183 published case studies. Our next webinar is going to be July 27th, and uh, we'll be hearing from Susan Wood and Rebecca Best at Northern Arizona University speaking about their project on ammonia and crayfish. Um, as always, contact me if you would like to receive um, these webinar announcements and you are not yet on our mailing list. We'd love to have new folks join us. Um, thank you again, everyone, for your time, and thank you, Jason, so much. Um, for joining us to give this excellent presentation. Uh, we hope to see you all again soon.